Hi, this is Ushio, and welcome back to Saturday of Leo's Root. We had a nightmare in the last episode. At least we think it was a nightmare. And also, we're hanging out with Leo, and I'm honestly, I'm really kind of creeped out by Leo. He's acting like things are our choice and of our own volition. But we kind of had a look at his phone when he wasn't there, and we can kind of see that he's pre-planned everything. So he's pretending we're making the decision, but he's actually manipulated us behind the scenes. It's it's very, very off and not very cool at all. But we're going to see where this goes. Leo wakes me up early the next day, telling me he had to sell some stuff with his dad at the shop. I don't get much of a chance to ask why or for how long before he's out the door, yelling something about food being in the fridge. I immediately fall back asleep though, and when I open my eyes again, it's two hours later. Leo texted me half an hour ago. Still at Pop's uh, shop, but be back soon, alright? I think. I swallow back down the lump of dread in my throat as I remember the text messages. I didn't want to confront him, not one bit, but I can't just let it sit. Something has to be said before I leave. I lay around for another 20 minutes before grabbing my phone to browse a bit, and that's when I realised I hadn't charged it last night, my battery at just 25%. I groan and throw an arm over my eyes one day left to do the project. I'm so far behind though that I'm not even feeling any anxiety about it at this point. I'm just resigned. I should have known better, really, that I wasn't going to get anything done with Leo around. I stare at the wall for a while longer before I force myself to sit up. No use lying around. I might not be making my best project, but it didn't mean I couldn't do a few things to make it less terrible. Food momentarily crosses my mind, but I shrug it off. I'd never been a breakfast person anyway. As soon as I leave the house, I notice things are a bit off. Firstly, it's dead quiet. Usually there's some kind of drone. Whether it's the wind or a plane overhead, there's usually something. No sound of birds either, and those are always chirping in the morning. I stand in the doorway for a bit, feeling a vague sense of tension, electricity in the air. Something building. I shake my head, feeling dizzy. That dream last night fucked me up in all kinds of ways, so it's not surprising that it's probably still messing with me. I'll be glad to be gone from this place tomorrow. Some rust in next door draws my attention, and I see Kudzu, carrying a set of clippers, walk across his front yard. I open my mouth to say hi, but I hold back, feeling self-conscious. His brooding nature was a bit intimidating, and I don't know if he's the kind of person who expects a greeting or not. I'm not left to wonder long, though, because he spots me almost immediately and raises a hand. Morning. Oh, hey there. He grunts before setting his attention on the bush in front of him, sizing it up. I stand there awkwardly for a bit longer, wondering if that's the end of our exchange, but he speaks up again. Leo take off. He nods his head at the empty driveway. Oh yeah, earlier this morning. I walk down from the porch and walk over to the edge of Leo's lawn, so it doesn't feel like we're yelling at each other. I said something about having to take care of business with his dad. Oh, I see. Kudzu stops trimming and looks up at me before smiling. You can come onto my lawn. It's not like I have an electric fence or anything. Kudzu's actually quite chill, he's just very grounded. Looking down, I see that I'm towing the edge of his immaculate lawn on Leo's side, looking like a little kid. I blush before stepping over to crunch along the tan-coloured gravel he'd set out. It's weird how nice it all is, especially compared to the shitty trailer that's sitting in the middle of it all. If he had an Adobe-styled house, the place would be southwestern perfection. This all looks really nice. I guess gardening's your hobby. Thanks. Kudzu snips at the bush rather aggressively. I like it. It's what I do most of the day. The raccoon moves to the side of the bush, examining it. It's peaceful. He gives the bush another snip before resting a hand on his hip while he lets the clippers dangle in the other. And it keeps you in shape. I can't argue with that. Although he's skinny, the muscles show through the fur on his arms. He's probably the most in-shape guy I've seen in Echo. I realise I'm staring and quickly snap my eyes back to his, but he's already smirking. I worry he's about to point out that he caught me, but instead he gestures at my camera bag with his clippers. You gonna do something for your project? Oh, uh, yeah, I need to get a bit more film before I leave tomorrow. The slender raccoon wipes his forehead with a forearm. Anything in particular? I have a think. Not really, just old stuff to show the town's age. Kudzu sticks the clippers into the ground, looking up as he seems to think. I know a few things. Did you go to the old school? Yeah, was headed there actually. And there's the ruins next to the lake. Yeah, I was going to wait for Leo to drive me there later today. 
other than that, there's the old rusted pump up the road, but I don't know if that's actually from Echo's earlier days. Couldn't hurt to look. Where is that exactly? Could see points over my shoulder, up the road. Down past Duke's house, right before the convenience store. It's kinda hidden back in some brush, but I can take you there. Oh, yeah, if it's no trouble. It's fine, I've got plenty of time to do this today. Well, okay, thanks. Kudzu, what is your job? What do, what do you do? Do you just hang out here? Apparently he's got some bad history up in Peyton, but we don't know anything about that. I shift the bag onto my shoulder and stand to the side as Kudzu tosses the clippers beside the bush and then starts walking toward the road. I follow him quietly, again feeling awkward under his no-nonsense attitude. So, you and Leo getting along? Yeah, we're having fun. My mind wanders back to the text messages and my stomach clenches. Good. He's been looking forward to this week for a while now. Wouldn't shut up about it last week. I'm somewhat surprised that it's Kudzu fitting the silence between us. Not that I mind. He's pretty damn good at it for such a sombre guy. I smile. Yeah, that's Leo. He really misses our old pack. Or does he? Kudzu has to laugh. Wolves. Yeah, I agree. Wolves. As we walk, I can smell the heavy musk coming from the raccoon, mingled with his scent neutralizer, evidence of a hard day's work. There's something special about hanging out with another musky creature. It makes you less self-conscious. So, I know you hate Peyton, but don't you have to, like, go back there for work? Back in the day, had a job studying desert plants after college. Good times. That would definitely put him a few steps above most everyone living in Echo, where a high school diploma is a rare thing. I'm a clerk at the town hall, so no, I'm pretty much always here. Always? Do you have a car? Sold it after I came here. Wow, don't you have to get out to the shop for food? And sometimes, I go and fish for what I can, and the convenience store has a surprisingly good produce section, but otherwise Leo gives me rides once in a while. Oh, gotcha. Again, I'm curious about what exactly what happened in Peyton. I'm going to be gone by tomorrow and I don't find the question to be too intrusive, especially with all the information he's provided me so far. So, I don't want to be nosy. I let the statement hang for a moment, and Kudzu turns his head toward me. Then maybe you shouldn't ask? That stops me short, and I almost stop walking. Oh, I feel my face get warm, even under the heat of the sun. I glance over at the raccoon, but his expression isn't accusatory or angry. It's just as neutral as it always is. It makes me wonder if this is just the raccoon's way of speaking. I already know how blunt he can be. I decide to trust what little I know about him and press forward. No. I ask it with the same straight face. Well, you should always ask yourself if asking something nosy is a good idea. No reason to do it if he's going to piss someone off needlessly. Ah, but before I can even consider, Kudzu goes on. Now, considering what we were just talking about, I can probably guess what you were going to ask. I can feel the embarrassment returning. Yeah, but before I answer it, I've got a question for you. I shrink a little more into myself. Yeah, why do you care? This question definitely catches me by surprise, and at first I wonder if this is just Kudzu's way of telling me to shut up. But again, after looking at his face, I decide to just tell him the truth. I clear my throat. Well, I like you. You're a cool guy. It comes out rather lamely, but it is the truth. He has a demeanour of not really giving a fuck about what others think of him. It's like Flynn, except Kudzu didn't seem like he was putting up a front at all. On top of that, he stepped in to stop a crowbar-wielding drug addict when he saw his friend in danger. Kudzu laughs, genuinely, and it's a bit startling. That's really the reason? I'm flustered again. Well, yeah. Fair enough. I like you too. Leo's mostly right about you. Oh, what did he say about me? A lot of things, but you can't expect a wolf, as last smitten as he is, to not exaggerate, can you? Oh, no. I guess not. I step on a particularly large rock and nearly lose my balance. Before I can even stumble, though, Kudzu's grasping my arm tightly, stopping me from running into him. Well, sorry, and thanks. This raccoon has damn fast reflexes. No problem. I start to walk again, but Kudzu doesn't move. I stop and glance at him, but he's looking up the road, not at me. I lost someone in Peyton. It takes me a moment to realise what he's talking about, and then I do. By a guy with a gun who didn't give a fuck. I swallow and I don't say anything, looking down at the ground. Happened on the same street we lived on. 
Of course I have no idea what to say, and wait for Kutsu to go on, but he doesn't. When I look up, I see that he's looking right at me. I swallow. Yeah, that would make me want to move too. Yeah, people. And there's less of them here. I'm sorry. Kutsu just looked back at me. Why? I open my mouth, but before I can say anything, Kutsu smiles. I'm kidding. I let my breath out in relief and laugh a little. Well, um, should we keep going? I make as if to walk up the road again, but Kuzu doesn't follow. When I look back, he nods at the brush on the side of the road. It's right here. What have we got? I wasn't expecting much, and I'm not disappointed as we come up on the pump. Mostly it's just a rusted piece of metal sticking out of the ground. Kuzu seems a bit put off by how lame it is himself. It's smaller than I remember it being. Eh, yeah, something. At least I'll get a few shots out of it. I start unpacking the camera from the bag, a bit reluctant to do it for something so insignificant. How did you find this thing, anyway? I look toward the road, which is basically hidden by the dense brush in front of me. Needed to take a piss. I know my house is right there, but peeing outside is liberating. Oh, speaking of which, I'm gonna go do that. He pauses. I can do it in front of the pump if you'd like. For effect. I force a laugh, wondering if this is the first time I've heard the raccoon make a joke. At least, I hope it's a joke. My laughing turns to a groan though, when I see the battery level. First my phone, now this. What's up? Kuzu asks from a bit deeper in the brush, facing away from me. My battery's low, I'm not going to have enough for the school. I'm going to have to go back and grab a spare. Oh, well, why don't you finish the footage for the pump, while I run back and grab you another battery? Are you sure? Well, yeah, it'll be faster. I've been in his house a few times. Where's the tat? In the dock. On his desk, next to the computer. Okay, I'll be right back. And with that, Kuzu jogs off out of the brush and back onto the road. Within a minute, I feel like I have all the footage I can get out of the pump. I sigh and rub my face, glad to at least be out of the sun, but annoyed that I've gotten so little footage for it. As I'm doing this, I hear what sounds like a gag behind me. I perk my ears and look back. I hear it again, but it's softer, more of a grunt this time. I'm almost positive that Kudzu didn't go that way, but I can't imagine who else it could be. Kudzu? I wonder if maybe the heat had gotten to him? I know how dangerous a heat stroke can be. Getting a little worried, I start moving further into the brush. Again I hear a gag, but it's much louder this time. Kud, you, you alright? I start pushing deeper, with a bit more urgency, and not 20 yards in, I come into a clearing. The ground is covered in dead grass, and the sun hits me again with a vengeance. I blink furiously, eyes watering under the brightness of the clearing and the blazing red behind my eyelids. After a few seconds, I'm able to pry my eyes open. The first thing I notice is a peeling trailer to the right, pressed up into the trees. I have some vague memories of a trailer back here, where a grumpy badger used to live. Straight in front of me in the meadow is a dead tree, one with dry, gnarled branches that twist up into the sky. The tree itself would be eerie enough, but it's what's under it that stops me dead. It takes a moment to comprehend what I see. Hanging from beyond the branch is a body, long and thin, emaciated down to the skeleton. I remain rooted to the spot, my mouth hanging open. Disgustingly, my mind immediately goes to the camera. I don't know why. Yeah, showing footage of a dead body to the whole class. Either I'd get an A for being edgy, or I'd fail for showing a, a fucking dead body. Probably expelled, actually. I feel my stomach starting to turn, and I'm finally able to take my first step back. But then it moves. It's a quick jerk, one of the skeleton's hands reaching up spasmodically to its neck before slumping back down. With my eyes fully adjusted to the sun now, I recognise the colour of the fur, the build of that skeleton-like body. Clint! On unsteady feet, I manage to stumble forward and reach out toward the ring towel, aiming to at least hold him up until I can shout Kudzu over to help. Somehow, though, he's able to spin and face me, his face an expression of mortified fury. His eyes are almost glowing with how bloodshot they are, and his twisted muzzle is covered in drool, leaking down his chin onto his chest. Get back! Leave! What, Clint, the hell are you doing? I move forward again, but Clint lashes out with a foot hitting me in the knee. That's when I see his toes are touching the ground, at least barely. I stare in confusion and look back up to meet Clint's furious eyes. Fucking leave. Spit flies from his muzzle as I take a step back, completely at a loss for words. I, I don't. 
His bulging eyes move from mine to look over to my shoulder, and his enraged expression melts, his eyes growing wider. Slowly, I turn around, and my vision is filled with a mountain of brown fur. My eyes take a moment to draw out and focus, and when they do, I realise that I'm actually looking at a bear. A huge one, even for a bear. Huge, naked, and carrying a long thin branch, the bear stands in the direction I come from, grinning stupidly at me. Instinctively I widen my stance, eyes looking left and right. All reason has seemingly left the land of Echo, and now my brain is left to try and put together the pieces of the crazy place together. I watch as a huge tongue sticks out from between the blubbery lips to lick at them, sliding slimely between the gaps of missing teeth. Once he's done with that, he breaks out into a grin again, those black licks shimmering under the sun. This a friend, Cat? The weirdly high-pitched voice is about as startling as its size. I look back at Clint, who's still struggling to stand on his toes, clutching at the rope now. It's so hard to find a good switch back there, but now it's worth it if there's two of yours. Uh, the squeak that comes out of my muzzle seems to perk the beard's stubby ears, and he licks his lips again as he eyes me up and down. Uh, I should get going. Sorry about uh, seeing um. Where's Felmy? As the bear takes a step forward, and I start sidestepping, preparing myself to make a run for it. The bear mimics my stance, and my stomach drops as I see him take another step forward. I change my trajectory, and back away instead. This time he doesn't follow me, just grins as he watches me move back into the brush. Clint struggles on the end of his rope, turning around lazily as he tries to get a foothold. I get one last look at his face as he spins around, and I'm struck by the expression. For a moment, I'm nine years old again, running behind the buildings on Main Street, probably from imaginary foreign agents of some kind. When I hide behind a tree next to Clint's house, I hear the screen door open, and for several minutes, I watch Clint breathing deeply into a rag. I'm too young to understand, but for some reason, I know it's not good. When I finally decide to run for my hiding spot, Clint looks up, and we meet eyes. His eyes are wide and wild, confused and hurt, just like now. I stumble into the brush, finally feeling like I'm far enough away to turn and really make a run for it. Because he's standing next to the pump when I get back, holding a battery. What? I grab his arm and yank him toward the road. Come on. I mutter it under my breath before jogging down the road, Kuzu close behind, looking over his shoulder. It's not until we're at the end of the road turning onto Main Street before I'm able to slow myself down and tell Kudzu what happened. Holy shit, that's Brian. Who? I'm still panting, sweating heavily in the heat after the short jog down the street. Biggest bear that lives in the brush, right? He's got a trader in there? I don't know him. Did he move here after I left? I thought a badger lived in that trader. I assume so. He was here when I got here. Whoa, the fuck was he doing? The hell did I just see? My mind is still trying to process it. I don't have the answer, but I can't say I'm surprised though. Are you serious? It's the most fucked up thing I've seen. Could you smirks? Well, I guess I would have had to have been there, huh? I stare at him. Yeah, I guess. But from what I know of Brian, he's dumb and violent. Pretty sure he came here because he caused too much trouble in Peyton. It's Clint that's the fucked up part. He's a fucking homophobe and he's doing that shit? Did we just walk in on some kind of kinky thing? I don't know much about Clint either. What I do know is that Brian is his dealer. Really? Well, really the entire town's dealer. It made sense that Clint would need one in Echo, considering he was banned for life from driving after getting like three DUIs. What's that dry do? Driving under the influence, is that? But I thought Jeremy did that. Cole told me that's where he got his weed. Cause he shrugs again. I assume Clint is using more than just marijuana. Oh. It's becoming clearer what kind of relationship Clint and Bear have. Oh no, that is nasty. I shudder, just wishing that I hadn't had to witness it. I already feel bad for Clint, but now... Kuzu holds out the battery still in his hand. You want to move to the school? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Let's get out of here. The next hour is pretty uneventful, though I do get enough footage to the point where I'm satisfied. There is a point where I notice Duke down the road. He stands there for a while, watching us as I'm getting different angles of the school. It's annoying, but even though he's a complete fuck up, he likes to pretend like he's in control of things in Echo. Probably just promoted himself to sheriff of the town in his mind or something. I ignore him though, and the next time I look up, he's gone. I turn my attention back to the project, finally able to calculate how much work I actually have left. Now most of my work is going to have to happen the night before the due date. I swallow, stomach churning at the thought. 
On the bright side, all of the stress is pushing the memory of Clint being hanged and whipped out of my mind. Later on, I finally get another text from Leo, just before my phone dies. What's the battery at? Zero, I'm heading back. I'm hungry, we should meet at the diner. Sure. I invite Kutsu to come along, but he tells me that he can't stand diner food, and that he was going to go fishing anyway. It's too bad, because I've really been enjoying the raccoon's company, and fishing sounds relaxing. I try to exchange numbers with the raccoon, but my screen dies the moment I turn it on. Kutsu takes my number though, and promises to text me. I'm feeling better walking to the diner, but then I remember what happened with Leo, and what I might have to do. Should I bring it up now? I don't even know where it'll end up going. Could I even trust him again? Yeah, he's been doing stuff behind our bags. Leo's not in the diner when I get there. I pick a booth toward the back, resting my head against the patchy cushions and closing my eyes. The week's gone by so fast. It feels like only yesterday that we actually got here. Thinking back, I remember worrying that everything was going to be awkward and that our past would catch up in the worst possible way. And it kind of did. We didn't fix or talk about anything. It gives me a jolt of realisation and sadness. This whole time, I've been preoccupied with Leo, and Leo with me. Wasn't Leo the one that was all concerned about us not keeping the pack together? This send-off feels empty and pointless. It's really the last time I might get to hang out with some of them, mainly Jenna and TJ. And TJ has the most shit to air out. Did I fuck up by basically ignoring him the whole time? I feel a lump in my throat as I think about the hike I never went on with him. Sure, I'd figured things out with Leo, at least temporarily. Very temporarily, actually. Already things are in jeopardy again. But now, it feels like things I should have talked about with the others have been buried further. Even though I haven't seen the others for a few days, I can feel their resentment, knowing that Leo and I got what we wanted. Or at least, I thought I got what I wanted. Especially after leaving them to deal with the fallout of Flynn's meltdown. And now, because of that, it's going to be harder to reach the root of the problem, harder to talk about it. And because of that, we probably never will. I glance at my dead phone, reminded of the complete lack of texts from anyone other than Leo. I suppose this is life. Sometimes things are buried and never talked about again. And in a way, I guess it's for the best. Sydney's death will die with us. It just sucks that we all carry it, but can't rely on each other for support. I take a deep breath, wondering how long it will take me to process the whole trip. Or maybe my entire life up to this moment. It's at this point I notice Janice hasn't come up to take my order. The diner itself is completely quiet, no old rockabilly coming up from the staticky speakers. I look around, wondering if maybe the place is closed. I remember a few businesses don't lock their doors. Mostly because of negligent employees, because burglary is somewhat common here. I look through the plastic window in the swinging door to the kitchen, past the counter, and notice that the fluorescent lights are definitely on. In fact, it looks like I can see some movement from shadows on the wall. I think about getting up and knocking on the door to let them know I'm here, and that's when the front doors push open. Leo comes in, a big grin on his face. Chula! My stomach twists as he sweeps up to my side, and I can't help but jerk it away when he kisses at my cheek. He pulls back, frowning. Uh, Chase? I sigh, not able to meet his eyes. Leo, I gotta talk to you about something. Immediately, I could see the worry in his eyes. He steps back, watching me. What? Yeah, you got busted, pal. We saw what you've been up to. Sit down. Why? Leo asks, but sits down anyway. First off, I have to tell him that I looked at his fucking phone. That's bad enough. I look to the right, heart pounding. Otter, what is it? His voice is soft, but I can hear the slight tremble in it. Leo, I looked at your phone. What? I jump as Leo's hackles rise as he bares his teeth. It's not an angry reaction, more defensive, fearful. Leo, why the fuck would you do that? I shrink back, looking down as I listen to his breathing pick up. I'm sorry, but you know what I saw. Fuck, fuck, man. Leo puts his face in his hands, which gives me an opportunity to look up. His ears are down, drooping toward the table. I, why did you do that? I wait while Leo continues to hide his face, his body rocking. Not now. Not now what? You can't do this to me now. Not after. I didn't do anything. You're the one texting people that I don't give a fuck about them. His head snaps up, then I can see his eyes glistening. 
I didn't say that. I just said you were busy. And what you said to TJ? Leo winces at that one, and he slumps back into his booth, his face dejected and desperate. Please, Chase, try to understand. Try to understand what? I let some anger into my voice, wanting to show Leo that I'm not going to forgive him just because he's sad. And I think he realises that, because his face changes, lips bared out of anger this time. Yeah, I'm real fucking guilty, aren't I? Yeah, yeah you are. Says the arsehole that just ditches me, avoids me and won't talk to me. I don't say anything in response. And you wonder why I'm fucked up about this? You're the one that just walked out and left me. I was young. Yeah, you keep saying that like you're not young now. If you actually had dumped me, then maybe I wouldn't be this fucking messed up about it. The last sentence escalates into a scream, and I flatten back into the booth, glaring up at him. Leo had never hurt me before, and I'm not afraid he will now. I've endured plenty of his tantrums. Do you know how crazy this makes you look? Oh, great. You too. I'm serious. This, this is fucking unacceptable. I'm drawing the line here. Leo's snarling face turns up, and that's when I hear movement behind me. I turn in my seat and see Janice striding out from behind the counter, the kitchen door swinging shut behind her. Janice? Leo's fur flattens down like he'd forgotten all about our arguments. It makes sense, why? Something's wrong. Janice had been acting strange all week, gradually looking more haggard and pissed off as time went on. Of course I hadn't forgotten what had happened on the side of the road a few days back, but I'd been content with just assuming it had been some kind of drug fueled adventure of hers. But now I'm convinced she's having a mental breakdown. Her fur is mussed up on every inch of her body, her eyes are wild and wired, similar to how I'd seen Clint earlier. Blood is smeared across her apron, and the handle of a knife sticks out of the front pocket. Janice, you okay? Leo's half standing, and I'm not sure if it's because he's afraid for her or of her. She doesn't say anything, and as she sidles up to our booth, I slide a bit toward the inside. Under her wild gaze, I kind of feel a little bit trapped. Janice? What's with all the shouting? Little impatient? Oh, well, let me take your order and I'll get you settled. Uh, you okay? Are you cooking? Leo gazes at her apron. Yes, yes, I'm cooking today. What can I make ya? I get the unnerving feeling that she isn't even looking at us. Um, Leo glances back at me, to which I respond with a bewildered look of my own. You know, I think we might... Uh, nonsense, I've got everything fired up in the kitchen. Leo doesn't respond. Just stares at the big coyote. Janice smiles crookedly. Well, if you're not going to order something, then I'll just make your favourite. With that, she turns and starts waddling off, having not even acknowledged me. What the fuck? I reach into my pocket, thinking about calling an evidence for the poor woman until I remember my dead phone. I whisper over to Leo. Should we leave? Maybe. But Leo doesn't move, and just stares after Janice. I look out of the window to the sun-baked road. Have you noticed that something's off? About Janice? No shit. No, not just her, the whole town. I think about mentioning the meadow with Clint and Brian, but I'm still trying to absorb that myself. Leo sits back, still looking at the kitchen door where Janice disappeared. Honestly, people act so crazy here, I don't know if it's because of the drugs, or because they're actually crazy. I see his nose twitch. And I don't think she knows how to cook? Something smells funny in there. Has she murdered someone in the kitchen? Please don't. I look back out of the window, wondering if I should bring up our argument again. That scene with Janice has totally thrown me off, and I'm reluctant to waste more energy on yelling. It has to be brought up again somehow. We can't just let this sit. It's clear that's exactly what Leo wants though, so I huff and stare out the window. This fucking town. I haven't been paying much attention to it in the past few days, being too infatuated with Leo. Sure I'd seen some weird things, but it seems in my absence everything's gone to the fucking wacky shack. I look at Leo. Have you been noticing any of this weird shit going on? Leo sighs. Again, I never know what's weird or not here. I guess I've noticed a few things. I frown. Were you just hoping I wouldn't notice? Leo doesn't say anything. Instead, he just goes on staring at the kitchen. Would he really just let me blindly move to this town when he knew everyone was going crazy? Looking out of the window, I notice a figure moving up the street, jogging. Is a feline? Is it TJ? Is that Tej? Leo glances out the window. Looks like it. Out for a jog, of course. The wolf turns his attention back to the counter as Janice comes out, a messy, dribbling milkshake in her hand. Hey, Janice. What are you cooking back there? 
I glance at the crazy coyote as she wobbles over to us, staring at the milkshake with wide eyes. Oh, you know, meat. Leo lets out a hollow laugh. Oh, um, what kind of meat? I'll be honest with you, it's a bit tough and stringy. I lose interest in their conversation and instead look back at TJ. I feel like something's off for sure. He's a ways away, but he kind of looks like he's afraid. One of his hands reaches out to bat at something? Something's wrong. I mutter it under my breath and start to stand, set on getting out of there to see what's going on with him. But at that moment, a truck pulls into the parking lot right in front of our window. I find myself staring at Duke. I also see something big in the back of his pickup, a brown furred head peeking over the roof. Duke. Leo snaps his head over to look out the window. As the weasel gets out of his truck, I see something in his hand. A gun. Shit. Language, Leo. He's bringing in a gun. Leo reaches across the table for me. Not while I'm in here. Janice! But she's already striding over to the doors just as Duke pushes through them. Chase, Chase, get down! But Duke spots us immediately. I told you not to fucking run away from me. He starts toward our table, but Janice, on her way toward the kitchen, intercepts him. Duke, is that a gun? I'm not going to have you barge in here to ruin the pace. She sticks her bulky body in his way. Get the fuck out of my way. Language. It's as if Janice doesn't notice that there's a fucking gun being waved around right next to her face. I reach out and grab Leo's arm, trying to put him down. Call the police. My phone's dead. Leo slowly sits and looks around. The only exit is at the front. We're kind of trapped. You don't think those fuckers are behind all of this? You've been seeing that otter around too, haven't you? I'm not concerned with that anymore. I've made things right. You're not fucking concerned that what happened to our grandparents is happening to us? I won't ask you to leave again. Her voice is threatening. From this angle, I can't see her hands, but I can see that she's reaching for something. She do have that knife on her, though. Oh my god. Chase, Chase, get down. Leo's voice is bizarrely calm. As he reaches over to me, I can feel him shake. He presses down on my shoulder, and as I'm about to slide under the table, I see Janice move forward, then I cover my head and cower against the booth under the table. Leo shouts and yanks me up against his side, covering me with his arms. I hear him breathe heavily into my ear, and I stare wide-eyed from under the booth, only able to see the dirty beige wall opposite us. Leo's breathing is all I can hear, and otherwise it's silent. Then I hear Duke muttering something under his breath, followed by soft padding footsteps. A few seconds later, his legs come into view and his feet turn in to face us. I see the gun dangling from one hand before he raises it slightly, pointing it at us. I close my eyes. How did this happen? Just seconds ago, Leo and I were arguing, and now I'm about to fucking die? I keep my eyes tightly closed, hugging to Leo as hard as I can and wait. But nothing happens. I keep my face pressed into Leo's chest though, wondering if I'm already dead. And finally Duke speaks. Leo, out. Otter, you stay there. I feel Leo hesitate against me, then his lips press against my ear. It'll be okay, baby. Just stay here. Slowly, he untangles my arms from around him, and then with his hands up, he pushes out from under the table and stands up. Face the wall. Leo hesitates and Duke growls. I ain't gonna fucking kill ya, we're just figuring out what's happening is all. Killing ya doesn't fix anything. The last guy got killed, and that didn't fix shit. You shot Janice? Cause she got in my fucking way. But it doesn't matter. Everything's fucked up now. Leo turns to face the wall slowly. Janice is dead. I watch from the space between the table and the booth. What do you want? To fix this fucking town? You're starting something with this otter. This has all happened before. Duke looks out the window and makes a cobble motion with his hand. We're going to stop it from happening this time. Leo looks to the left. But you fucking killed Janice? I hear the wolf's voice break slightly. Won't matter in the long run. The doors rattle as someone comes in. You got the zip ties? Hands behind your back, Leo. Leo looks at whoever just came in. Oh, come on. Now. Slowly, Leo does as he's told, and I see a pair of massive paws reach forward to bind the wolf's wrists. I swallow hard as I watch Brian pull the zip tie shut. Okay, Duke forces a forearm to his nose. Fuck you, stink. I hope you didn't kill that ringtail. We could use him. Brian just grins in response, his teeth yellow. My heart sinks as I think about Clint. 
Had he been warning me to run? Why had I thought that him hanging like the tree was probably just a normal thing for him and the bear? Was he just a victim of whatever crazy just hit the town? That must have been what was going on. All of this is hitting at once. It can't be a coincidence. Krim was probably just as scared as I am now. Grab the otter and tie him up too. Just stick him in your trailer for now. My stomach drops. Duke gestures with his gun again. Come on, out. My legs are lead. I can't move. Leo looks over his shoulder at me, and the fear in his eyes scares me even more. His muzzle moves, mouthing something. Run. But still, I can't move. I've never been so scared in my life. It's like everything is numb. Brad doesn't care though, and moves forward, the look on his face eager. The gun goes off again. Everyone, including Brian, jumps and I hit the floor with my hands over my head. Fuck. Fuck. I look up and see Duke, eyes extra wild, dancing around, pointing the gun upwards at the ceiling. Fuck, you see that? She's crawling round up there. I told you she's on my ceiling every night watching me. Brian's looking up too, and for the first time, his face is twisted into an expression that isn't stupidly grinning. It's full of fear. But when I look up, I see nothing. Chase. Leo hisses at me, and that jolts me back to reality. Without even willing myself to do it, I shoot out from under the table. In front of me are two exits, the front doors and the kitchen door, which is closer. There has to be an exit in the kitchen, but I'm not sure of that. My legs are already making me run though, and I have to choose now. Oh no! Big decision time, and I'm going to be a horrible person and cut the episode off here. What do I do? I guess I'll make a decision in the next episode. This is Usho signing off, and hopefully I will see you then.